Now, if you've studied basic chemistry at school, you will have learnt a fairly simple way of understanding how atoms come together to make molecules called Lewis diagrams. But if you've taken chemistry to a higher level, then you will have learnt a more complex version of that theory, which involves hybridized orbitals. Now, this hybridization theory is not really different to the uh, Lewis diagrams that we've been using before, at least in its basic concept, but it is more complex, which means that it takes more effort. Now, with Lewis diagrams, we only look at the principal quantum shells, these main onion layers around atoms. Now, of course, atoms aren't really built up like layers of an onion, but it's a very simple way to understand how they work at a basic level. But with hybridization theory, we have to learn that those principal quantum levels are further divided into sublevels, suborbitals, the s orbitals, the p d orbitals, the d orbitals, and so on. And hopefully you've also learned that those orbitals are actually three-dimensional waves. And what that means is they can come together and interfere with each other constructively and destructively. And then they can make different shapes. The shapes that we need to get electrons in the places that we need them for making our three-dimensional shapes for our molecules. And it is these combinations of the suborbitals that we call hybrid orbitals. No? You haven't learned about that? There's a link in the description. Now, these hybrid orbitals now give electrons a way to exist in the spaces that we want them to exist in for making the shapes of the molecules that we see by experiment. And now, instead of overlapping principal quantum shells, we can overlap these hybrid orbitals to make chemical bonds between atoms. So whether you should use Lewis diagrams or hybrid orbitals depends on the level of theory that you need for the chemistry that you want to use in your job. So for most engineers and scientists, Lewis diagrams are fine. They just help you understand that there is a rational basis for the way that compounds and molecules form. And knowing those basic rules help you to have conversations with chemists. But any time that you need to get into the details of how atoms rearrange to make different molecules, essentially you will be working in some sub-discipline of chemistry, then you will need to learn hybridization theory. So, hurrah! We've got two ways of looking at how atoms make compounds and molecules. One, very simple, but not enough detail. Another, more detail, but more complicated. Be a shame if they were wrong then wouldn't it? I mean, wrong might be a bit harsh, but the simple fact is that valence bond theory doesn't explain certain behaviour and it completely fails to explain certain phenomena. For example, it's bad at explaining aromaticity and it completely fails to explain why oxygen gas does not have a double bond. No, it doesn't. And that's a video for another day. And perhaps more importantly, we don't have experimental evidence for pairs of electrons being trapped in a small space between atoms or being trapped on the outside of atoms as lone pairs. So if valence bond theory has serious flaws, what can we use? Well, the answer is molecular orbital theory. Now, crucially, molecular orbital theory is completely separate to valence bond theory. Now, we aren't thinking of pairs of electrons trapped between two atoms in a single chemical bond, 
but rather all of the atoms can use all of their valence orbitals to make new molecular orbitals that extend around the entire molecule. And we don't have single, double or triple bonds anymore, but rather we have bonding orbitals that pull atoms closer together into a molecule and antibonding molecules that pull atoms apart. I'm not going into any more detail than that for now. That's a video for another day. But anyway, when we combine all of these orbitals together, what shapes do we get? Ah yes, that's the problem. You see, for small diatomic molecules, it's not so difficult. The kind of thing that you find in a textbook, you can work it out by yourself with a little bit of effort. But as soon as we start building more complex molecules, things get a lot more difficult very quickly. And that's the fundamental difference between valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. With valence bond theory, we can look at each pair of atoms as we go along the molecule and see how they fit together. We can take out any little chunk or piece of a molecule and understand it separately. We might say that valence bond theory is additive. We can take any bit out and put it back in again. But with molecular orbital theory, we have to consider all of the orbitals all of the time. And that makes things incredibly more complex, but it also gives us a much more accurate level of detail. But it's not just the shapes of the orbitals, now it's also the energies that are important. And in fact, it's just a small change in the energy of the orbitals of the O2 molecule that mean it doesn't have the double bond that we're expecting. So predicting shapes is no longer enough. We also have to predict the energies of the orbitals. So it's no surprise then that using molecular orbital theory requires computers and hours, days or even weeks of computational time, depending on what kind of computer resources you have and how complex the molecular system is that you're looking at. But that same complexity means that molecular orbital theory is incredibly powerful. We can make real predictions now, predictions that we simply can't make with valence bond theory. Does molecular orbital theory have flaws? Yep, it certainly does. But it's still the best theory we have for making predictions about chemical behavior. Also, molecular orbital theory underpins band theory, the theory for how materials conduct heat and electricity. Now, you don't need a detailed understanding of molecular orbital theory to understand band theory, but if you really want to get down and tinker with materials on an atomic level, then at least a working knowledge of molecular orbital theory will help a lot. So, what does all of this mean for those of us who either have maybe just an interest in chemistry all the way up to those of us that are using chemistry professionally as part of our jobs? Well, the answer is that you use the right tool for the right job. So, Lewis diagrams are simple, school students can use them, and they work fine for most scientists and engineers. But hybridization theory is the minimum level for professional chemists. Most professional chemists can get by fine with mostly hybridization theory, but we should at least have a basic working knowledge of molecular orbital theory so that we can understand some complex situations, things like aromaticity, things like cycloaddition reactions, things like unusual bonding situations. And also the way that complex molecules behave, for instance, molecular catalysts or dyes for organic LEDs. But if we need a detailed understanding 
of how complex molecules are going to behave. And especially if we need to predict how they will behave, then we must use molecular orbital theory. And that means investing significant time in learning the theory and then significant time and money in software and computers for running our calculations. So you can see that most synthetic chemists are better off working with hybridization theory and then having some form of collaboration with theoretical chemists. But we need to be able to talk to each other. So for that reason, we need at least a working knowledge of molecular orbital theory. And after all of that, at the end of the day, no one really knows what an electron is. It's true. There's no sensible way to say how big they are, and we don't even know what shape they are. I mean, they're very round, down to a very small accuracy, but exactly how round, we still don't know. So until we do have that better understanding, all of our models will be flawed somehow. And so what we need to do is simply use the most appropriate flawed model for what we want to do. And that is a choice that you will have to make for yourself. Well, I hope this quick summary of molecular bonding theories has been useful for you. If so, please hit the like button and then I will make some more videos. And if you hit the subscribe button, you'll know when they come out. Everyone's a winner.